Basement of La Penta. It's WICR. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to College Football Corner, the radio version, before we head into the studio and start filming the first episode of the year, but obviously coming off of a fantastic first opening weekend in college football. There are so many good slate of games to get to. I think at the end of the day, Obviously, we on College Football Corner, we always try to concentrate on the top ones um, because for TV purposes, you can, can't really go as long as you would on radio, but kind of wanted to come on and just do a little appetizer, you know, give somebody, everybody a little bit of extra content before we head into the TV side. But I think right off the bat, you've got to start off with the Alabama-Wisconsin game. Obviously, Alabama winning 35-17. to And if you listened to my shows last week, I did think Wisconsin had somewhat of a shot here. Uh, I just thought... But for the most part, there was a lot of uncertainty about this Alabama offense, especially at quarterback. What was it going to be? Was it going to be Jay Coker getting the start? Was it going to be Alec Morris? But it was, in fact, Jay Coker. And I think for the most part, uh, he played and he did his job pretty well. I mean, when asked about him after the game, Nick Saban still said, I just hope he can continue to play well. So I don't know if that was the biggest uh, guarantee and degree of certainty there. But look, Alec Morris did his job and it clearly helps when you have a running back like Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry just tore up the day. Bama's new power back and I think when you look back at Alabama over the years, especially during Saban's tenure there, I mean Mark Ingram, Trent Richardson, Eddie Lacy, TJ Eldon, there's a trend of feature backs who all help elevate the conservative quarterback. Now, obviously a lot of times when you say conservative quarterback, it's a negative connotation on on that player. Um, but I don't think necessarily all the time it is. I mean, sometimes it's not. I, I, I firmly believe you need an explosive quarterback. But look, the, the proof is in the pudding. There's con- a lot of conservative quarterbacks who've won a lot of big games in college football. But I think when you look at McElroy and A.J. McCarron and then Blake Sims, uh, there's a trend there of guys who are would be more labeled conservative. And I think regardless of who Alabama starts this year, it's going to be, again, a conservative quarterback. And it will be he will be greatly helped out by having a power back like Derrick Henry, who, again, when you look and you try to try to compare him to someone, I think it's got to be Trent Richardson. I think it's got to be Eddie Lacy. There's a lot of things that the similarities between those guys. And that's the kind of guy Nick Saban likes. Big, strong, with speed, breaks a lot of tackles. Henry had a really good day. Um, and I do think, though, this was a nice kind of way to start off their season because you definitely, definitely wanted to see, look, if if you did go with Coker, and there were a lot of reports heading into even opening uh, the opening game that it would be Alec Morris getting the start, but it was Jay Coker. Jay Coker didn't get to start last year, and it seemed like he was lined up to do so. So I think the fact that he comes out and he has a, a rather plays rather well, I think that bodes well for his confidence, and clearly having Derrick Henry, who just kind of set the tone immediately of what he's going to do, and he's going to be able to help elevate that conservative quarterback. I think Alabama couldn't have asked for a better start to their season, and obviously, I mean, Wisconsin could get nothing on the ground. That's always the story with Alabama. You always know Kirby Smart is going to bring that stacked defense, and you're just not going to be able to run the ball on them. Aside from Gus Malzahn uh, in his Auburn Tigers, I really have have not seen anybody in the last five, six years who've been able to consistently run the ball against Alabama. And again, that trend continues, and it continues again this season. Uh, Alabama's next game coming up, Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders. Uh, they might win that game 60-14, to honestly. that's So their next competition, not that a nice little break coming off of this big one. Got to go with next, the Notre Dame Irish beating the Longhorns 38-3, to and Obviously, this one wasn't the most riveting game in the world, but I, I think it, it makes a statement. I think it makes a statement about both programs, where both programs kind of are. Texas still is just not in a good position, and, and it's amazing how just since Colt McCoy's time there, they have not been able to find a replacement for him. It, Tyron swoops. I mean, just the guy's just not that good. It just there's not really a whole lot of ways you could say it. I don't think he was that great last year. This year, he still had to win that starting job and he did but I don't think that says much about the guys who are behind him he's just not very good I I love Charlie Strong I think the discipline he brought there and this in the defense and that mentality he has is good but again 
Texas is just not getting the players that they used to. It's just the way it is now. When you have a lot of other programs in Texas that are really coming to the forefront, you look at what TCU is doing, you look at what Baylor is doing, you look at what Texas A&M is doing. Texas has a lot more competition in that state for the most... Honestly, what... And a lot of people consider the Texas Longhorns to be an even bigger fan base than the Dallas Cowboys in that Texas area. But still, I mean, you look at what all the other programs they're doing. They're the ones who are getting the best players. Texas has not. I mean, even you look at the quarterbacks for all those other programs. Trevon Boykin for TCU. You look at Kyle Allen for A&M. They have embedded quarterbacks there. Texas has not been able to find that guy. And it was ugly. It really was the, the big takeaway here, though, is, is Malik Zaire. I really, really like what we saw from Malik Zaire. 18 of 22 passing, to, uh, 300, over 300, uh, three touchdowns. The guy really is a good player, and he's got mobility. The biggest thing I like about him is how patient he is in the pocket. This He's not going to rush his throws. He's not going to make a lot of mistakes because he's very patient. He waits for the right plays. He waits for the receiver to make the right route. Uh, he just does the right thing. And I think coming off of Everett Golson's season last year where it really was all defined by turnovers, played well, but again, those turnovers kept on killing them I think this is much needed and I think he's really going to have a nice year for them Leek Zaire looked very strong now you look ahead a little bit for the Irish at Virginia next week interesting game but again you think they still win that one after that is where I think it gets interesting Georgia Tech now that's an interesting game it really is because Georgia Tech we all know what kind of offense that Paul Johnson likes to run that it's very difficult to stop um, very speedy very high pace we saw in the I think a lot of people really got a good look at them against Florida State last year and the kind of offense they like to run but I think here it's a really good test for them early because I do think there's a lot a lot of playmakers on the Notre Dame defense. And Malik Zaire, clearly, I think he can put up points and go against them. And Georgia Tech's one problem is, again, in that type of offense, your quarterback is usually exposed when you have to throw the football, as he was against Florida State. And I think a lot of times when you're playing these top-tier programs, that's the case with a team like Georgia Tech. You go on to highlighting a little bit of next week again, Michigan State and Oregon. Obviously, both programs win big this weekend. Oregon, very, con I would say, I would even use the word, yes, very concerning. Only because, look, we know Oregon's offense is always going to travel. We know it doesn't matter who's going to be at quarterback there. They're going to be embedded in there. You've got a ton of talented playmakers. No one can really replicate or stop that offense, the speed and the spacing that they have. Vernon Adams Jr. looks like he's going to fit right into there, played a very good game. But I still think at the end of the day, you've really got to be concerned about that Oregon defense. I mean, you gave up four over 40 points, 42 points to Eastern Washington. And I mean, I just, this game was only on the Pac-12 network, so didn't really get to see uh, it aside from the highlights. But you just kept looking at the score and how Eastern Washington just kept scoring and scoring and scoring. I mean, Oregon obviously scores 60 points themselves. But that defense is is looked very shaky off the bat, and that's a big concern. It was a concern. It's been a concern for Oregon. Is that I mean, last year it was a combination for Oregon of obviously they made it to the national championship game, but there was clearly problems for the Oregon Ducks, which is why they lost. That offensive line was an issue, and then that defense was an issue. Obviously, I haven't seen a, a gotten a good look at the offensive line yet, but I think defensively, giving up 42 points in your first game against Eastern Washington is not a very good sign. And Connor Cook, that we, we have seen his progression, and last year, that game against Oregon and Michigan State was a real battle for the Ducks. I mean, if it isn't it wasn't for Marcus Mariota really having one of his defining moments at, in college, I don't know if Oregon survives that game, and it's a different story this year. That defense, again, really, really want to see how they clean it up because Connor Cook is playing very well. There's a lot of people who really like the way that he's been playing. He could have a big day, and especially if Eastern Washington had a big day like that against Oregon's defense, I would expect Connor Cook to have very similar results. Oregon's offense is really going to have to come to play for that one. Then you move on. I think... If one person kind of had to get the crown for winning the weekend, 
it obviously have to be Josh Rosen from from UCLA, and I think it's funny because I was talking to a friend of the show, uh, Joe D, who works for CBS Radio, does terrific work for them. I mean, he's got a very well connected, with talks to a lot of big people there, and he was kind of passing along some information about me, and the amount of people who just praised this kid. I mean, they're, they're Paul, Paul Meyerberg, worked, who works for uh, his national college football writer for USA Today, he said that Josh Rosen is the best young quarterback he's ever seen. He said he's going to be on the Mount Rushmore of quarterbacks. He's going to just blow it all away. Uh, even Joe D said he thinks this this kid is the next Andrew Luck. And if you watched him, I mean, 28 of 35, 351 yards, three touchdowns, it was almost about as flawless of a performance as you could get. And there's sometimes when you watch a, a true freshman like that, and you just can tell with their first snap, this kid is special. I mean, I, I got that feeling with Jameis Winston, his first game against Pips, Pittsburgh. When I watched his first drive, you could just tell, this kid is just special. Josh Rosen is, is that same thing. How flawless he was in that win this weekend against Virginia, it just I mean, it just made your jaw drop, honestly, and I think we're going to continue to be talking about this kid for a long time now, and clearly, I mean, look, the fact that there's people already going out there on the record and saying that he's the best young quarterback I've ever seen, I think that's a big, bold statement, but again, what he did in that game, really, really impressive. I mean, just out of this world impressive stuff there. I really think that this kid, Josh Rosen, is special. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch him this season. The final game on the slate for this warm-up for the TV version. Again, we will have that TV version in studio after this one. Uh, is Ohio State and Virginia Tech. Obviously, 42-24, to Ohio State winning it. Some ups and downs, but again... There were people saying, look, it looked a little bit shaky, but Ohio State pulled away. And that's the funny thing is, yes, it was shaky at points, but at the same time, I think that those wounds for Ohio State were more self-inflicted than anything. I think they are the ones who got in their own way. I don't necessarily know if there was anything that Virginia Tech was doing that really was giving them problems. Now, you give them credit for the defense that they run. That did give them some problems. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott, obviously, on his first snap, the 80-yard touchdown, unbelievable. But for the most part, they Virginia Tech did a good job at really covering up and, and not giving him a lot of space to work with. But I think at the end of the day, you look at them, and obviously the biggest talking point is JT Bear and Cardell Jones. Now, JT Bear gets a start, and I'll be honest, I was surprised JT, uh, I'm sorry, that Cardell Jones got the start over JT Bear, um, especially how good JT Bear was for so long last year. I mean, I think when you look back at that Michigan State game, I think that's all you really need to know about what JT Barrett is. The the way that he picked apart Mark D'Antonio's defense in the air, on the ground, that's a big-time game. And he was just as money as you could get for such a young guy. Even when he came in that game last night, I mean, how quickly he just put that ball in the air. Beautiful touchdown. The, the, when he just burned it and had that huge run. Again, Cardell does a lot of things very, very well. I think if you have to compare the two and you have to pick away a big difference between them, I think it's the short game. I think JT Bear is much better at the short game working the field than Cardell is. Cardell obviously has got a cannon of an arm, and he's just a bulldozer when he runs into you. But, I mean, they too, the, both of them, it's a problem a lot of people would like to have. And clearly... When you have Braxton Miller, and Braxton Miller probably is the one who stole the show last night, displaying his athleticism. And again, that is what Urban Meyer does. I've always contended he's the best coach in college football. Now, a lot of people think it's Nick Saban. But again, you look at their records head-to-head. You look at what Urban Meyer's done in bowl games, 8-2. and two. You look at what Nick Saban's done in bowl games, 8-8. Eight and eight. That's a big difference there. I just think Urban Meyer always has found the best athletes, and he's put them in the most important places. It's been a quarterback. It's been what he's used with Percy Harvin. You see now what he's doing with Braxton Miller. It's just that is what Urban Meyer does. And look, Ohio State, as you've heard many times last night, they're double-digit favorites in every game they play this year. They will win every game this year. The only interesting thing of their season comes in really the final couple weeks with Michigan State and then Michigan right after that. Two very big emotional games, but again, 
I still think it's going to take Michigan a while to figure things out. Harbaugh's first season, there's a lot of growing pains there. And Michigan State, obviously, we'll see uh, this weekend with a big game against Oregon how built they really are to play against the big boys. Uh, But I I still think at the end of the day, it's always going to be a talking point. Cardell or JT Barrett, because as soon as, like, let's go for an example last night. Cardale Jones obviously lights it up in that first quarter. is fantastic. I think people right off the bat are saying, well, obviously, this is why Urban Meyer makes him the starter. But then it gets a little shaky for a little bit. And that's what I think you've got to be worried about is when Cardale does start to show that shakiness, what are you going to do? Those Buckeye fans are going to be calling for JT Bear because there are a lot of people, myself, I like J. I prefer J.T. Barrett to Cardell Jones. I just like his his short game a little bit more. I like his athleticism, his movability a little bit more. Um, but again, not a knock. Cardell is a fantastic quarterback as well. But again, that is going to be the interesting thing to say there. But are there are, are is Ohio State vulnerable? Which I've heard a lot of people asking today after last night's game. I don't. I wouldn't say that. I really wouldn't. I think they showed vulnerability last night. But if there's anything we've seen after Urban Meyer's career, it's that he has a does a fantastic job in making adjustments during the season. His teams always get better over time. They will be better again. You also had some big time players who were out of this one. I think this was a good start on the road. I, I like what happened with TCU, and I like what happened with Ohio State. They go on the road for their first game, play in tough games. They get they, There's a little bit of vulnerability in their games. I think that keeps you honest early. I think for such big programs with such big rankings and big expectations, keeping you honest this early in the season, making sure you stay sharp and on your edge, I think that's that's very important, and I, that's why I really like what happened there. And then it's even better for Ohio State because now you have Hawaii in Week 2. They might put up 70 points against Hawaii. It'll be a very interesting. I think both quarterbacks clearly will get their playing time. Um, it's going to be a very fun conversation to continue to have, though. But this is wrapping up the little radio preview this morning. Going to head right over to the studio and get into the TV segment. So, folks, you're not going to be. It's not, you're going to be seeing a lot more of me today. So. Don't don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. 